So welcome, everybody. Uh, good to see you all here. And uh, we're going to talk about Confident Elixir today. Um, I'm hoping my voice holds out. Uh, if we end up with uh, sock puppets and interpretive dance by the end of this, uh, that'll, that'll mean it didn't quite work out. But uh, hopefully, I got a half hour left in me. Um, so talk is Confident Elixir. Uh, the inspiration for this talk uh, is a book. Uh, by Avdi Grimm called Confident Ruby. Uh, how many people here have a Ruby background? Yeah, if you read the book? Wow, there's a lot of hands out there. Um, so yeah, I found a lot of value in this book and I started thinking about, um, so how do some of these ideas translate into Elixir? Uh, and I think they translate quite well, actually. And uh, Elixir is a very natural fit for some of these ideas. Uh, so a big portion of the book is, uh, is about patterns. Um, but it's not a patterns in the large. It's not like a gang of four uh, style pattern where it's at the class level or multi-class interaction level. This is uh, more implementation patterns. So it's patterns sort of at the, uh, the method or function level. So we're going um, to keep to that scale uh, throughout this talk. So natural question, what makes code confident? Uh, and uh, Avdi's answer is uh, confident code tells a clear and coherent story. Uh, and of course, we prefer short stories to novels uh, in terms of code, especially at the, uh, at the module, at the model level. So how do we tell a good story? Uh, and a good story has four parts. Um, and the order matters. Uh, so we want to be able to read a method or a function from top to bottom, and we should see these things in order. So first, we're going to go gather data. We're going to do some work. We're going to return values. And we're going to handle errors. All right? uh, and then there's some other things uh, along the way. So we want to have very short functions uh, that reveal their intention very clearly. We want to have minimal use of conditionals, uh, and we want to have minimal use of error handling for flow control. Um, so Avdi, in the book, he brings up um, this idea of uh, these choose-your-own-adventure books. Remember those? So you get to the end of the chapter, and it says something like, you know, if you want to see the princess kill the dragon, go to page 250. Otherwise, go to page 300. And those books are great if you read them in that order. But if you start at the beginning and you read from front to back, it's chaos, right? Because Princess has already killed the dragon, and then all of a sudden the dragon is back because you've, you've moved them out of order. So conditionals can tend to do this in our code. And if you take that to an extreme, you get something like this, which, uh, hat tip to Greg Vaughn, this is uh, the Gilded Rose Kata. Uh, which Greg has uh, kindly uh, translated into Elixir. And you see, I, you, you, this, this doesn't tell a story. Um, this, is, this is really hard to read, really hard to figure. So what we want to do uh, when we're writing coffee code is avoid stuff like this. I wish I could say that uh, I've never actually seen code that is this extreme, but I actually have. I haven't written it, but I've seen it. <laughs> All right, so uh, if my high school English teacher is watching, this is the thesis for the talk. Elixir's built-in language constructs make writing confident code easy and natural. Uh, and I actually uh, really believe that. So uh, let's take a look at some of the building blocks that Elixir gives us. We have pattern matching, very powerful. Uh, we have multi-clause functions, also very powerful. Guard clauses, these three work together uh, to allow us to tell a really clear and coherent story, to break down conditionals. Uh, and we also have supervision trees, which are like uh, the ultimate in, in writing confident code. So let's go through uh, the building blocks quickly. Um, the first is pattern matching. So if you've written any Elixir at all, you've seen this. Uh, on the left, we have the pattern. Uh, in the middle, we have the match operator. On the right, we have the value, so the equal sign is definitely not an assignment operator. It's a match operator. And its job is to make uh, the value and the pattern match. So if on the left we have uh, a variable that's easy, all the match operator has to do is bind that variable to the value on the right, and away we go. 
So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, that's the one that we just had there. Uh, we'll notice also that uh, the match operator will return the value at the end. That's the return value. So we can turn it around. Uh, and because we've already bound the value A to the value 7, this just says 7 matches 7. Perfectly great. All right? uh, we can rebind in the new match. Uh, some purists have difficulty with this, but never fear, all is well. Uh, the values are immutable. They never change, just a different binding. So this returns 9. We can also use the pin operator, uh, which says don't rebind. Use the last value for the variable that you are bound to. This will fail because we just uh, bound it to 9. So it's saying 9 matches 7. That's not going to work. Uh, there's also uh, the underscore, which matches anything but does not bind to anything. So this will match, but if we try to use the underscore again, we get a compile error because it's unbound. So we can use all of these things together in pattern matching. Uh, we can get it a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we can use literal values for a pattern. Uh, so we have a three-element list, three variables, uh, matching a value of a three-element list of literals. The return value is obviously the list. But what we get for this is uh, we get destructuring for free. Right? So all the variables are then bound to uh, the values on the other side. This is pretty standard stuff. Uh, so the number of elements matters, uh, and also the types matter. So you can't have uh, any mismatch there, otherwise it's going to blow up. So and there's one last thing about lists. So we can actually pattern match um, to pull uh, the head off the list and uh, uh, also pull, remove it from the rest of the list. So the head is going to be a single value, and the rest going to be always a list, even if it's an empty list. Tuple's the same. Um, same thing here. But uh, once we get down to literal values in the pattern, uh, this last one is what's called a tag tuple. Uh, so the first element gives us more information about uh, what this tuple's all about. And we can pattern match on those as well, and we still get uh, the data destructuring that we care about. OK, maps are more interesting a little bit. Um, so uh, an empty map uh, will always match another map, always. Uh, but we can also add keys. Now, the keys have to match. Uh, but we also get data destructuring with this as well. So our name comes off um, and is bound to Frank. Uh, if we actually um, give a key with a, um, a literal value that doesn't match, we get a, pat a match error. And as we would expect, if we give it um, a, uh, a key that doesn't exist in the map, that'll be a match error as well. Uh, structs. Maps will match structs. This will always match. Right? But the reverse is not always true. So if we have a struct, even though these both represent the same kind of thing, um, structs have extra keys and values in them uh, to say what the uh, module they came from is. Right? So the map, unless the map has those in there, which is unlikely, that's not going to match. OK, and pattern matching in the wild. Where do we see these things? In assertions. That's what we've seen so far is uh, these, these things used in assertions, but they're also in function heads. So uh, we, can, we can pattern match on the arguments that come into a function. Um, and unless the argument that comes into this function is a user struct with a name key, this function will not be called. Uh, and we can use function heads with extra binding. So there, that uh, equals user bit, the user uh, variable will be bound to the full user struct coming in and will uh, also have the name variable being bound. So inside the body of this function, we'll have available to us the name and the full struct. OK, and in case statements. So here. Uh, in this line, uh, that's the value in pattern match against 
the patterns here, okay, user or error reason, uh, and we'll do the right thing along the way. All right, now multi-clause functions. Um, this is the second uh, building block that we have. Uh, so we can define multiple clauses of a function with the same name, which is weird if you're coming from some place like Ruby, and these are all clauses of the same function, or we can define multiple functions with uh, the same name but different arity, and those are different functions. So let's give some examples of that. These will all be the same function. And we notice we, when we name functions, we name them by uh, their name and arity. So this function is say one, right? So we get a single argument for say, and uh, we're using literal values in here, right? So that they will pattern match to differentiate themselves. Uh, obviously, order matters. So uh, uh, if we had switched the order of these and say we have def say words on the top, that will always match. Uh, and there's no chance that the other two would possibly even match. So the compiler will give us a warning about that. So we want to put the one that will, uh, is sort of like the fall through the de facto, put that on the bottom. Okay, and these are different functions. Even though that's a list, it's a single argument. Uh, and this is a double argument. So that's another one and another two. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So, this is a legitimate question. Um, are these things better than branching conditionals, uh, multi-clause functions? Uh, I think they are, um, because uh, each clause is much more focused, tells a uh, much shorter, clearer story. Um, and using uh, pattern matching and uh, what we're gonna talk about next, guard clauses, we can be very, very specific about the code that goes in each one of those things. What the we can be specific about the conditions for each one of those. Um, and all of the behavior for a given set of specific conditions is really separated out from all the other things. Okay, and now on to guard clauses, part three. So guard clauses are just functions, right? And their job is to check arguments at runtime, just make sure we're getting the right thing. Uh, and they work together again with multi-clause functions and pattern matching for really, really super fine-grained control. Um, there are a limited number of these things that we can use because they have to be super fast. So imagine if uh, guard clause had to go to the database and get a value uh, and bring it back to make a determination whether this uh, function should be called or not. That would kill uh, uh, performance. That would be super terrible. So here are some um, of the available functions that we have. There are these type check functions. Is Adam, is binary. There's a whole bunch of these. Um, so I only listed a few. Uh, there's some comparison operators, all our old friends. Uh, there's some arithmetic operators. Excuse me, um, uh, so we can do math uh, when we're doing uh, guard clause and Booleans. It's a whole list of all the things uh, that we can use in guard clauses available in the Getting Started Guide. All right, let's take a look at some examples. So um, we, uh, the, the when uh, keyword here is uh, used to begin a guard clause, and now we're checking that uh, this word is a list. And remember, single quoted string is actually represented as a list of characters, uh, not uh, like a double quoted string is uh, a UTF-8 encoded binary. So in some cases we need to have a list, so if we need to have a list, this is the thing that will work. We can do uh, comparisons. Obviously it doesn't make sense uh, to compute a square uh, with uh, x is less than zero. Um, we can mix and match these things with Booleans, and we can mix and match all of them if we want to. And the final uh, building block that we have is uh, supervision trees. And these really, um, these make it super possible to do uh, a really, really confident code. Um, and I say think of, uh, unobtrusive JavaScript for error handling. Anybody, is, is unobtrusive JavaScript still a word? Does anybody know what that means? Yeah, 
So, uh, so the idea behind unobtrusive JavaScript is back in the day, uh, we used to write um, a lot of JavaScript. We used to write flat HTML files, put a bunch of JavaScript for that page uh, in the head tag, uh, and then do the bindings, the event bindings, in uh, the markup itself. And then we decided, let's take all of that out, put it in its own uh, file, and then use CSS uh, selectors in order to figure out which element we want, bind the behavior that we want. Supervision trees do that with um, error handling code. So right now, in most languages, we mix our business logic and error handling code together. And with supervision trees, we just take all of that out and put it off in its own place. So it can do its job. The business logic can do its job. And we'll talk more about that when we get to error handling. So let's focus on what it is to tell a good story. So uh, there are four parts, remember. This is the first part of telling a good story, collecting input. Uh, in order to be confident about this, we've got to make sure that uh, our types are right. right? And most, mostly what we end up doing is we end up converting our types. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to do conversion. And the best place to do it is at the borders of our code. So since we're talking mostly about uh, functions and methods here, the border would actually be the, uh, the function definition. So in Ruby, we might do something like this. Notice it's at 2i, just to make sure that the iterations is an integer. But in order to do this explicit conversion, we have to do this in the body of our code, in the body of our method. So we've already sort of breached the border uh, already. And in Elixir, we might do something like this. Now, um, we do a check at the boundary first to see, is this thing a binary? If it's a binary, we convert it to a character list. And we call ourselves recursively. Then we have another uh, clause for this. Uh, when we call ourselves recursively, the, uh, the virtual machine is going to go back to the top. And it's going to run through this first clause again not going to match, going to fall through to the second one, and then we're going to call uh, our, our Erlang function. This actually um, is something that happens all the time because uh, Erlang expects strings to be character lists, and uh, Ru uh, I almost said Ruby. Elixir uh, uh, wants them to be UTF-8 encoded binaries. So if we're doing Erlang interop, this is a thing that uh, happens fairly often. Um, so the question is, should we go hog wild with this? Should we like create a clause for integers and Booleans? The answer is no, uh, I think, because we want to just code for the common case. And uh, for anything else, we just let it crash. So uh, we can also do custom conversions. Um, and this is something, a uh, code snippet from uh, Phoenix itself where uh, protocols give us the ability um, to uh, create implementations for each type that we might want to convert, right? And so uh, we can confidently just say two param on virtually any type that will come in, and there'll be some way to handle it. OK, on to doing work. OK, doing work. Uh, is all about sending messages and calling functions. All right. uh, and the main thing is we need to trust the receiver to do the right thing. We just want to make the call. All right. We don't want to ask the receiver, do you respond to this message? Uh, are you such and such a type? We just want it to go. We just want to call it and go. So uh, if we. Well, let, let's not do this. But if we uh, do have to query the receiver, we end up creating conditionals, right? So um, if it depends, if the message we're going to send depends on something about the receiver, we're going to end up with problems like this. And this can grow. I've seen this a million times. So let's do something like this instead. This is. Um, classic duct typing, polymorphism. So we make sure that no matter what gets passed in as a rate sheet, that it will always respond to the calculate method. And 
go ahead. This, so this is a Ruby example. Uh, and let's give Elixir its turn. Um, so what about this? So at, first of all, we, we do check at the, at the boundary, at the, at the function definition itself, its boundary. Is this input OK for us? If it is, we just start send, uh, calling functions. Uh, and we don't ask at all about what this thing, um, we don't ask at all whether the receiver of these functions can, uh, can handle it or not. And so the pipe operator just exudes confidence in that way. Let's take an active record example. This is uh, slightly different. Um, so let's say we just had a, a wrapper function, a wrapper method, I'm sorry, around something in active record. Since save returns a Boolean, Boolean doesn't tell us all that much about what's going on. We have to ask it, so OK, did it work? Did it not work? And then um, take action accordingly. Um, but in Ecto, uh, Ecto, the insert returns a tag tuple. So we can just take this, uh, the return value of this, and just pipe it into uh, a, a handler function. So if it uh, matches OK model, this tag tuple, we do insert things. Otherwise, if it matches the error chain set, we do error things. And we're able to split out um, the, the functionality for each of these cases. Um, again, the question, so is this, is this really saving something? Well, if there's only one or two lines in each one of these, maybe not. Uh, but if these things become complicated, like we have to send emails and do a variety of other things, the cognitive load of these things all in one function can become large. This makes it uh, a lot easier to think about and debug later on. And uh, so the third part of telling uh, a story a clear story is uh, return values. And three things we want to do with those. We want to make them benign, basically not nil. Uh, make them meaningful, like give them some uh, extra meaning by adding information to their surface. So think about the last example. The um, uh, active record return value is just true or false. It doesn't really help us out that much. Uh, but with uh, Ecto, we get a tag tuple. The tag actually gives us a lot of information. Did this thing work or not? Uh, actually, Ecto used to return just a change set, and we would have to query it for errors. Was the thing valid or not? And then make decisions based on that. We no longer have to do that. We can just send the message on and go. So benign values. So thinking about, um, uh, think about the case where we have three possibilities. Uh, none, or three possible return values. None, one, or many. This is the right way to do it. We give it either an empty array, uh, a single uh, element array, or a two element array, or list, uh, instead of this. Uh, and why? Because the second uh, way we have to ask, are you nil, are you a string? Are you an array? Are you a list? We have to keep asking questions. And as we ask those questions, we build up conditionals. OK. Uh, the other way to make a benign value is uh, to stu substitute a null object. So um, the very common case is in web application, we can either have guest users or logged in users. Um, well, we can either have a logged in user or nobody. Right? And uh, so oftentimes, if we just return nil, uh, if we need to fill out the UI, we have a real problem because we're asking nil, what's your name? We're asking nil, when's the last time you were here? So we create a null object that has the same API as a regular user, but uh, has canned uh, data in it. These are great, but they're also a problem because we need to make sure that these APIs don't shift. The thing is, in Elixir, it's all just data, right? So a user is uh, represented as a struct. Guest user is just a different struct with some canned data in it. If you want to get fancy, uh, we can put that behind a guest user function, and it returns the, the, um, 
the pre-canned data that we actually need. So we also have meaningful values. We need to have more meaningful values. So uh, in a case where we might return a nil or a value, uh, we can return a symbol instead, or an atom. Uh, atoms are easy to pattern match against. So here's an example. So if we want to register a process in our, uh, in our uh, virtual machine, um, this will return an atom yes for success or no for failure. Uh, it's not nil. Nil actually doesn't tell us anything. It's like, is there something there? Is there not something there? Did it work? Did it not work? It's just nil. We, and we can't ask it any more questions because it'll blow up. And we can have even more meaningful values. These are tag tuples, which we've talked about. Uh, and uh, so we've seen the, the OK model error reason uh, a bunch of times already. Um, it makes things, it makes pattern matching really, really simple and easy. And we get the added benefit of being able to destructure the data automatically. We get that for free. Uh, and we don't have to query the thing to figure out what we need to do next. So there's all kinds of examples. These, this pattern is everywhere. So if we start up a, uh, a gen server, we get a tag tuple with OK and a PID. Actually, if we open up a file, we get OK and a PID as well. Uh, Phoenix channels return tag tuples all over the place. So for join three, we get either OK socket or error reply. For handle in, we get all of these and so on. Uh, and enumerable, actually, inside for each enumeration, um, it will represent an accumulator as a tag tuple to figure out what it's supposed to be doing next. So this is, this is adding extra information to our uh, response values. And now on to error handling. So um, in most languages, this is where it begins and ends, right? You've got begin, raise, rescue, all of these keywords. And we put all of this stuff inside of our business logic. But in Elixir, I mean, let's cut to the chase. We rarely ever do this. In fact, we should kind of just forget that these things ever existed uh, for the most part. There are reasons to use it, especially if we need to present um, error information back to the user. Uh, but for control of the flow, let's just not, not do it. Instead, we build a supervision tree, and we just let the errors crash the process that they occur in. So why is that a good idea? That's a legitimate question, because uh, in most languages, if you've got uh, untrapped errors all over the place, you're going to have a bad time, uh, right? But um, for us, um, the reason this is a good idea is that uh, we can't actually plan for everything that's going to go wrong. And we can expend a lot of energy trying. So let's just not do that anymore. And we always know that there's something that's going to fail. So let's focus on recovery instead. Uh, and part of the idea is that um, with a supervision tree, something down here, a leaf, might die. Uh, and all we have to do is restart that leaf. And we localize the error to that small subsystem instead of letting the error propagate throughout our system. And how can that even work? Again, in most languages, this is not even a possibility. So because we have processes, VM-level processes, that are completely independent, they don't share a stack or a heap with anything else, uh, any of these processes can crash, and it doesn't affect any of the other ones. Because processes have an identity, they can be linked together, and they can monitor each other. And when they can monitor each other, then uh, a monitoring process can start to take action if another process is dying. Usually that means uh, restarting it to a known state by one of several of these uh, predefined strategies. Let's talk about those next. So one of the strategies is one for one. So if one uh, worker process terminates, it'll be restarted. So if the middle one dies, gets restarted, away we go. 
Uh, another one is all for one. So if this middle one dies, they, uh, the uh, virtual machine will terminate all of them and restart them to a known state. Uh, and this one, rest for one. So we have to imagine uh, that um, these processes are started in an order so that the one on the left is started first, uh, middle one next, and uh, the one on the right is last. And they have some dependency on each other so that, let's say, the one in the middle crashes. Uh, we will rest restart it and terminate the, any of the processes that were started after that and restart them like that. And the final one is a simple one for one. And this is basically one for one uh, with only a single worker uh, per supervisor. Uh, and uh, the documentation tells me uh, this is good for when you're uh, uh, attaching, dynamically attaching workers to supervisors. So that one dies, that one gets restarted. All right, so what does this all say about confidence? Um, so we keep error handling code out of our business logic. So the story remains clear, and uncluttered, uh, and we really code for the happy path and let the chips fall where they may because uh, the supervision trees have our back. They're going to restart things for us when things go bad. Uh, and that's it. This is me. Um, and if you're interested in more of my work, uh, I'm the principal author and maintainer of the Phoenix Guides. That's mostly what I'm known for in the world. So thank you.